Hi, Mahesh Thapa here, and today I want to go over normal pediatric hip ultrasound when we're looking for DDH. We're going to go over plain film and CT correlation and show you exactly how these images are obtained by looking at some videos of the ultrasonographer doing the exam itself. Hopefully you'll find it helpful and you'll come back for part two where we talk about imaging and harness, uh, the different type of harnesses there are, and various maneuvers that orthopedic surgeons perform to look for DDH. This is how coronal images are obtained. Note the position of the probe. It's somewhat posterior and the femurs are freely moving as the sonographer obtains images, sometimes cine clips, going anterior to posterior. And here is the still image where measurements are going to be made. Let's take a deeper dive into the coronal image of that right hip. Here it is. I'm going to bring in a plain radiograph and show you some of the structures so you can make better sense of what we're looking at. So here is a plain radiograph, not of the same patient, a little older, but for the purposes of what we want to do, it's going to be fine. I'm going to try to take this image and make it look like this so you can appreciate the anatomy. Let's rotate it now. So the bottom is the right hip, and we know this is the right hip. So it's, we're almost there already. We're going to get rid of the top half, which is the left hip. And the only thing different now really is the soft tissues and the iliac bone are sort of opposite. You know, this is at the top uh, and this is at the bottom. So if we just take this and flip it, so we get very similar looking images. I'm going to make it a little larger and closer. And so here we go. So if you can appreciate this, this is our femoral uh, neck and shaft, which we don't see, but we see the iliac bone over here, which corresponds to this iliac bone. And we see the acetabular tectum over here, which co corresponds to this acetabular tectum. Uh, and of course, this area of hypoechogenicity is our unossified femoral head. Now, here the iliac bone is sort of angled, superlateral to inframedial, and here it's straight because this is actually taken slightly posteriorly. This angulation that forms between the iliac body and the acetabulum uh, gets gradually less and less and becomes more vertical as we go posterior. And to illustrate that, I'm going to actually show you a clip from a CT scan at the end of this part to convince you that, in fact, uh, this really is straight the more uh, further back that you go. But at this point, let's go ahead and draw some of our lines to see what we're looking at as far as the anatomy. We already know that this is the iliac body. This is the acetabular tectum. Uh, this is the unophosphified femoral head. The white stuff that you hear is the fiber fatty pulvinar uh, that you can see. Uh, and of course, laterally uh, is going to be our uh, uh, subcutaneous tissues uh, and the gluteus muscles. So we draw a line along that iliac body and extend it across the unophosphified femoral head. The second line that we draw is along the acetabular tectum which forms this angle and this angle right here is what we report as the alpha angle and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, a third line that we don't typically draw but which is assumed is this line right here this green line and if you notice where the green line originates on the plane radiograph it's sort of at the inframedial as aspect of your tectum so in essence this is just Hilgenreiner's line and what do we have we have a nice right triangle we know that all angles of a triangle have to equal to 180 degrees. This particular triangle is a right triangle, meaning that one of the angles is already 90 degrees. And it's this triangle, or this angle right here, that's 90 degrees. That means that these two angles that are left over have to equal to 90 degrees because they all add up to 180 degrees. What do we say typically about the acetabular index angle? Typically, we say it should be less than 30 degrees. Of course, it matters how old the kid is. There's a table. For general purposes, however, we say that angle should be less than 30. If we say this should be less than 30, that implies that this angle, the alpha angle, should be greater than 60 because they have to add up to equal 90 degrees, right? And so that's where that relationship comes in. And that's why when we report these numbers, the alpha angle, we always say it should be 60 degrees or greater because it's sort of a indirect measurement, if you will, of your acetabular index angle. So again, this is the alpha angle. This is the acetabular index angle. And we know the alpha angle has to be more than or equal to 60 degrees because the acetabular index, as a general rule, 
uh, should be around 30 degrees or less. Let's go ahead and get rid of some of these lines, but we leave the uh, red line. And we have extended that line, as you see, across the unossified femoral head, right? Now, if we draw a line from the red line at the mid aspect of that femoral head to the medial margin of that femoral head, we get a certain distance we label as little d. Now, if we compare that little d to the larger diameter of the complete femoral head, as it's designated by big D, if we take the ratio, we say that should be more than 50%. It just means that more than 50% of that femoral head should be covered by our acetabular tectum. If it's not, then it designates uh, an abnormality usually. So that's where some of these numbers come into play. Now let's take a look at that CT I promised you and see how the relationship of that iliac body with the acetabulum changes as we go from anterior to posterior, how it goes from a more uh, supralateral and inframedial to a more vertical orientation. Here is a CT from a four month old. I wanna show you what the shape of the ilium does as we go from anterior to posterior. These are the coronal images on the left and these are the axial images on the right. So let's just see what happens when we go from front to back. We're going back, you notice the red line is going back. And now we get to the joint really, and then we see the ilium, where the iliac bone, the body is angled, uh, lateral superior to medial inferior. As we go further back, you notice the shape of the body or the iliac wing changes to a more vertical orientation. So that by the time we're here in the joint, more posterior in the joint, we see that the iliac body and wing are in fact a lot more vertical. And this is around where we image our ultrasound. This is how we obtain trans images. Note the location and orientation of the probe. It's again somewhat posterior and it's perpendicular to the orientation from before. And this is the still image from the trans orientation. Okay, so now we have that axial or trans image on your left here from the ultrasound we just showed. And for the sake of looking at the anatomy, I brought in an axial image of a CT scan. So this is the right hip, uh, corresponding to the right hip of the ultrasound. And let's go ahead and rotate that and get it in the same orientation. And you notice that indeed it is in the same orientation now. Here is your ischium or ischial tuberosity over here. And that's what you see the echogenic structure over here. I'm gonna just crop out the stuff we don't need and then make it a little bit bigger and move it down. So you can appreciate that a little bit more. So this region right here is going to be your unossified femoral head, which is this. This right here is the triradiate cartilage, which corresponds to this area of low density here. And this area right here, which you can barely see, is your pubis. So, and this right here is going to be lateral. This is posterior, and this is anterior. Similarly, lateral, anterior, posterior. So these muscles that you see over here going posteriorly corresponding to these muscles here are again your gluteus muscles. So this gives you an orientation of what we're looking at. This is how transflex images are obtained with the hip inflection. Here is the still image of the transflex position. And finally here is the right transflex view on the right and I want to compare it with the right trans view on the left. Essentially, it's the same image. The way we get it is the same. It's just the position of the femur is a little different. If you look in the bottom, here you see the transducer is oriented in the axial plane with respect to the pelvis, same on this image and on this image. The only real difference is the femur or the hip is flexed on this right image, you see you see the orientation of the femur over here. So when the transducer is placed in this orientation, some of the femur is gonna appear on the image as we see over here. Here is the unossified femoral head. Here is the metaphysis of that femur that corresponds to this femur over here. And on this image, because the femur is not flexed, it's not held in a flexed position, we don't really get the metaphysis. All we are gonna get is the head of the femur as we see over here. All the other structures are the same. Here again is the ischium or the ischial tuberosity corresponding to that structure right over here. This low echogenic stuff is the triradiate cartilage, triradiate cartilage. Here is the anterior pubis, and you can see a little bit of the anterior pubis right over here. And again, the subcutaneous tissues and the gluteus muscles go from anterior to posterior. 
over here anterior to posterior. So the only thing that confuses some people is the fact that you see the metaphysis on the view and this explains why you see the metaphysis. Well, that's it for normal pediatric hip ultrasound looking for DDH part one. Be sure to come back to look at part two where we have an orthopedic surgeon explain the various maneuvers, the different types of harnesses that are available, and what imaging looks like in harness. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you want to see more pediatric radiology related content, be sure to subscribe. Thank you.